Hello and welcome to the Never Heard of It podcast. This is Craig Moorhead. And I'm Sean Harwell, and this is the show where we catch up with all the movies that have fallen through our cracks. That's right. Now, you can uh, obviously find us on iTunes, you can find us on Stitcher, you can find us wherever uh, fine podcasts are sold. <laughs> we are at neverheardpodcast.com on the webs, at neverpodcast on the twits. We also are uh, Instagrammed now, if you enjoy looking at uh, photos. Yeah, and it, it seems like we got a lot of other podcasts following us, which is nice. And Yeah, it's great. Uh, there's a lot of good podcast stuff up on Instagram, a lot of great movie curator still images and etc and so if some of you are listening for the first time welcome this is not a chronological podcast at all Mm -mm, so mm -mm. when you have time you can go back and see all the crazy crap that we've been watching (laughs) the the archives yes and you can also find uh, the podcast on youtube if that's how you prefer to listen to things you won't see us talking nope it's not a visual experience maybe we'll do that sometime Maybe. I don't know why anybody would want nice. to watch us talk. <laughs> I, we don't even watch us talking. Yeah. It'll be like C-SPAN. It'll be great. So today, we're going to talk about a film by the name of Max Dugan Returns. It's from 1983, directed by Herbert Ross, the director of Footloose. Yes. And... Citizen Kane. He did not do Citizen Kane. He didn't do Citizen Kane. No. Well, but he, he, he's done uh, lots of movies you would, uh, you, you would have heard of. Funny Girl, Funny Lady. Mm-hmm. Funny Old Lady. Secret of My Success, Still Magnolias, My Blue Heaven. Look at that. Boys on the Side, Soap Dish, True Colors. He's been nominated for Academy Awards. Another little interesting thing about Herbert Ross. Yep. Uh, it appears that he made the transition from being... A, an actor, B, a dancer, and C, a choreographer, to becoming a film director. And that, that is that's pretty amazing. And pre- I, I think Bob Fosse is like the only other person I know of that's made that transition. Uh, there may be others, but yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. It looks like he mostly was uh, a theater guy, and then in 1968, he was a choreographer on Funny Girl uh, for the stuff of Streisand, and then the next thing you know, he's, he's directing. A lot of Neil Simon stuff, too. Yeah, I was going to say, that certainly makes sense, because this is a, a Neil Simon, originally a play. Uh, it, it stars uh, 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 Jason Robards, Marsha Mason, Matthew Broderick, Donald Sutherland, and and even Kiefer Sutherland, confusingly. Blink, and you will miss it, because I did. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I assumed he would be playing Donald Sutherland's son, and yet someone else plays Donald Sutherland's son. That's right. Just seems like a, a missed opportunity there. And and the sharp-eyed among you may uh, spot uh, Argyle from Die Hard. My eyes aren't that sharp either. I had a I, I looked up Kiefer's little little bit online after the, I watched the movie, and yeah, he's he's basically just like a background high school yeah. kid. I mean, I don't think he has a line at all. Well, and that's the thing, you know, uh, the the first time Matthew Broderick is driven to his school, his mom is commenting about how one of the boys who's standing outside the school. Uh, wasn't he expelled for something? Didn't he get in trouble for something? And I thought she was talking about Kiefer Sutherland because you can see him in the shot. Yeah. When they drive up and he's kind of looking at their car and I was like, oh, he's going to be kind of like the like the heavy or something. And no. Too bad. No, you just see him a couple yeah, times I, and then it's all done. Yeah, I think he was a little green at that moment, but as we know, he's an excellent heavy later on. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Sean, mm-hmm. you had never heard of this movie. So what what were your impressions? I thought it was enjoyable and kind of lightweight. Mm-hmm. My sort of knowledge of Neil Simon is mostly uh, I've read and seen Brighton Beach Memoirs, Biloxi Blues. I knew pretty well from being a kid and watching that a bunch. And, you know, I mean, I, I definitely know of The Odd Couple and like his involvement and all that kind of stuff. And, I mean, that's, that's somewhat it. So mm-hmm. I was kind of expecting. I'm kind of what I got, you know. I, I think it, it's it's a character piece. There's a lot of dialogue, and it's somewhat limited in scope, and mm-hmm. it's maybe a little less melodramatic than I thought it might be. But uh, yes. yeah, I, I think it's it's fun to watch for the performances. I got some issues with with <laughs> kind of tonal things in that, but I will say, Craig, my opinion is obviously very valuable. But I, mm-hmm. I'd also like to share with you. <laughs> what Roger Ebert had to say about this movie, because I think in some ways he's maybe saying it better than I am. Just in some, 
Right. So just, just this little bit here. Indeed. He wrote that Neil Simon's gift is also his downfall. He's so good at writing lightweight dialogue that it all begins to sound the same. In Max Dugan Returns, for example, there's a running gag about whether the dog is named Plato or Pluto. And the trouble is, the first time the names are confused, we know with a conviction, approaching certainty, that they will be confused again and again. I'll interrupt that to say, I, I didn't necessarily see that, that coming <laughs> or even think about it afterwards. Yeah. He continues, Max Dugan Returns is watchable and sort of sweet. I agree with that. Robards gives a poignant performance as a dying father, although the movie makes him express his love through expensive gifts that are sort of off-putting. Totally agree with that. When the movie is over, however, it seems to evaporate. It doesn't have a purpose for being. It's just spun sugar and a few tears, a plot situation set into motion to create the illusion of suspense before everyone gets what he wants or fears or deserves. There's hardly a moment in the whole movie that would be confused with daily life as it is really lived. Maybe that's the idea. Completely 100% agree with the last part of that. Yes. And that was my biggest issue with this movie. We will totally get to that. And I do want to hear what you think about this, but I also want to hear, tell me again why this was on your radar. Was it the poster? Yeah. Uh, so, so there's a drawn yeah. poster of a man in a trench coat with a briefcase he's holding with sort of stars spilling out of it. So, so I, I always saw... Like I remember seeing that in a movie theater, and I really remember seeing the box in rental stores as a kid. And, and I realized one of the things that kind of really put it on my radar as a kid was the fact it looked like it could be a dark movie, like a scary type of movie, and it was rated PG, which meant I could rent it. <laughs> and that's why it was always on, and I just couldn't figure out what it was, though, so I never went for it. Yeah, it's not, it's not really scary at all. No. no, no. Can we let's make an assumption here? This movie mm-hmm. came out in eighty three. Yeah. If you remember seeing the poster at the theater, yeah. What do you think you would have been there to see? Maybe E. T. Wasn't that eighty two? I mean, it it was it would have been like a now playing type of deal. Okay. Well, that's true. They're, well, sometimes they put out posters in advance. Yeah. Usually inside, not that's outside. True. That's true. But um. Man, that's a good question. Maybe I was there to see uh, DC Cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's also it's kind of interesting that you know uh, Matthew Broderick is in this and then later did Biloxi Blues with another Neil Simon thing but yeah, this came out same year I think as War Games came out later in this year I believe right yeah. and then Project X and you know he's definitely off and running man he looks so so young in this um, yeah. but he, he's playing like what a 16 17 year old kid I guess mm-hmm. um, in high school I enjoyed his performance I thought he was good yeah, I, I did too. I mean, I, really, I think everyone... I mean, the cast is really strong. Uh, I, I do agree with, with Ebert. I mean, it really is... It, it does just evaporate. I mean, for all, for all... There's so much dramatic potential for this movie. I mean, <laughs> right. enormous amounts. I mean, like it starts out with, with a mom and her son who are just sort of barely making ends meet. Nothing seems to be working out for them. They have this terrible car that someone actually steals. I believe it's a 63 Volvo, she said. Something like that, <laughs> yeah. It looks like a complete jalopy out of like the Grapes of Wrath or something. Yeah, it just looks like a tank. And so, you know, so they're struggling, but they're, they're mother and son and they're sticking together and that's great. And then, and then uh, you get a little bit about how her, her dad, she doesn't really know him. Maybe she says that he died. Or she she had told them that he had died. She had told then, Matthew yet. Yeah, and then and then it, then she says he didn't die, and she gets very confused. And anyway, so one night he shows up in the dark, in the rain, with these briefcases. It turns out the briefcases are loaded with money, and he says he's dying, and he wants to give her this money in exchange for letting him spend these days with his getting to know his grandson. Okay. Right. He knows that he's, his relationship with her is terrible. He left. She, she doesn't even know him. Not really. And you know, he, he, he says, I'll give you this It's like $600,000. I'll give you this. If, if I can spend these days with my grandson, I mean, and there's so much, if you were really going for melodrama, there's plenty there. Let's break that down for a second. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So Max Dugan shows up and I, Correct me if I'm wrong. It's mm-hmm. literally the same day that she has that conversation with Matthew Broderick. Oh, yeah. And so, slight coincidence, 
bit of convenience. You can forgive that, I think. You do yeah. find out when, and the mom is played by Marsha Mason, if we didn't say already, who I didn't know that well. She was married to Neil Simon and has been in a bunch of his movies. Although, interestingly, I think they got divorced before this movie came out. <laughs> so that might have been an awkward premiere screening. Anyway, you find out later through dialogue, she has not seen him in 28 years. Right. And so that also to me is like, man, there's just, there is so much to um, unfold from that. Yeah. I mean, that's an extensive, extensive time period. She knows he was in jail for a while. That's about it. And, you know, they never really sit down and have those conversations about the hell were you doing all these years? Yeah. You know, and we don't, we know very little about her mother, Max's, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming they were married, his his ex-wife who was dead. We know that much. And uh, we know very little about her husband who also died. Yeah. When Broderick was a bit younger, I think. And so, yeah, I mean, I think those are all elements which invite a lot of melodrama. And again, I think that's where I point to that sort of Ebert thing. I wanted to bring that up front. Because yeah, I think if this woman exists in real life and this man exists in real life, when he shows up, that's going to be a really different conversation. Yeah. Whether or not he's saying he's got six months to live and has a briefcase full of cash or not. Right. There's a lot to deal with there. And they don't really do that here. And in some ways, I was kind of glad. And in other ways, I thought, okay, but that doesn't, it doesn't give the movie a lot of heft, I think, at the end of the day. It, it doesn't. No. And it, it sets up, uh, what's the phrase? It kicks over a lot of anthills. It's maybe not ready to kick over. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, like it, it comes out that he's stolen this money from the mob. Right. So he's trying to keep a low profile. That much I understand. That's okay. And interesting. But, I, I like that. Yeah. It, right. Exactly. Super There's interesting old man, backstory. You know, yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, you don't really have to give me the payoff. <laughs> but it does feel kind of weird because it, it feels so loaded at the top where he's, I mean, he's stolen these from, from bad guys and, and they never show up. Right. And, and I guess that's fine. That's yeah. fine. Like, I, I can't really like, you know, I, I, I don't know. But that, I think that gives you a, a, an idea of, of how lightweight it is. Well, and like the story he told her originally is that I can't remember after he got out of prison, he got into real estate. He had a bunch of land in Vegas. The mm-hmm. casino wanted to take his land to expand. He wouldn't sell. They took it anyway through litigation. Yeah. And so he actually goes to work at that casino as a blackjack dealer and over a number of years skims $680,000 off the top. And right. so it's sort of like, they took the money from me. This is rightfully mine. You should feel okay taking it. It's rightfully yours now because I've abandoned you when you were nine. Yeah. You know he's deceitful and not mm-hmm. trustworthy. He's still kind of likable. Yeah, absolutely. What, one thing I really liked about the way the thing was written was she does get mad at him, and she does say no to him over and over and over, but then she sort of turns that – she becomes a sympathetic character to him and sympathetic person yeah. to him and kind of softens her stance. But I think is that's really in keeping with what we know of her before he shows up. Because she's a bit, right. she's a teacher, a high school teacher, clearly scatterbrained. You know, she's basically waking up or being woken up by her son to go to school. And she hasn't finished grading her papers. She runs into the shoe repair place, leaves the key, you know, the, the car running, and that's when it's stolen. And so there's all these little things going on. And like just the way she sort of processes all that and handles it and deals with the detectives and deals with the students in her class, you know, it's. She's just one of these people who's obviously juggling a lot. And yes. like it, she can't let any one thing beat her down or it will all beat her down, you know? Yeah. I, I like that. And I like how she portrayed that, I think, Marsha Mason. Yeah, absolutely. But we should talk about, Craig, Please. Mr. Donald Sutherland. Because he comes in before Max Dugan. And he is the lieutenant sent to follow up on the car theft. And that is how he initially meets Marsha Mason. To give me your two cents on the speed at which they develop an interest in one another and how that worked for you. I mean, it was kind of goofy, but again, it kind of goes along with how the rest of the movie feels. Mm-hmm. Super lightweight. And, and it, it kind of seems like, well, she's completely set up to 
have a romantic interest. So here he is. <laughs> like this, this, he kind of has to be it. Oh, and he makes no bones about it. I mean, he is yeah. all over her. He calls and, her within like 10 minutes of having met her. Oh, immediately. You know, and, immediately. And, yeah. I mean, yeah. after the interview, he's driving around to pick up her son and taking her home. And then he brings a, I mean, yeah, he's, he's to a stalkerish degree. It'd be interesting to see like how it, how it would play right now if this movie came out today. I, yeah, People I, would be like, he seems kind of weird. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. But no, he, he just, he's very uh, persistent in pursuing her. And so they end up uh, going out. Then Max Dugan shows up. And of course, that complicates it even more because right. Donald Sutherland is a cop. Well, and that's, to me, that's a bit of a conflict that I had with the movie itself because... Mm-hmm. You've got this man showing showing up, who all he wants to do is give all this money, which he gained through probably ill-begotten means, right. and he's spending lavish amounts of money on his daughter and his grandson, right. while pretending to be this other person, Mister Parker. Right. But knowing that his daughter is dating a cop, flags are going to go up when <laughs> a cop comes over to pick up this woman. And suddenly there's a Mercedes in the driveway. Right. Or there's an entirely brand new kitchen. Yes. You know, and it does. And I mean, and that's kind of how that plays out. So yeah. at one point, you know, I sort of end up writing, they just need to get their story straight. Like <laughs> They need yeah. to come up with a lie. Yeah. Father and daughter, this is what it is. And this is what we're going to say, because they don't do that. And it's no. just, yeah, it's painfully obvious. And, and especially when, when Donald Sutherland and Marcia Mason go out on that date and she ends up dropping her purse, which has five grand in it. And he's already <laughs> asked about the Mercedes <laughs> and, and all these things are going up. And like, I'm glad that they didn't paint him as a foolish character. I mean, Donald Sutherland is asking questions. He's like, I can't just let this go. Like, you have to know that, that this yeah. looks crazy. And like, he even, I think at the end of that date, when he's walking around, he's like, I got to say, I had a lousy time, which I kind of loved that line. And I was like, yeah, that's that's a good way yeah. of putting it. I mean, it's not the end of their relationship. You know, he's willing to give her a second chance and all that stuff. She'll just answer some questions. But I don't know. It, if any of those people were a little bit smarter, the, the Mason and Robards character, mm-hmm. they would have come up with a story. <laughs> you know, there, there was a part where I was kind of hoping, I, I, and I think it's when she tells... Max to tell, and I didn't understand this either. Uh, you know, tell tell my son the truth. I'm gonna go take a shower. Mm-hmm. It's like really like you're not gonna hang around in the room and at least like be there with your son while this guy tells him that he's his grandfather for right. the first time and there's all this confusion. So she goes and takes a shower, and of course he tells a different story that's another lie. Mm-hmm. I, and I guess my thing is, it, it, for me, it was a little frustrating because the whole time he's telling this new story i just kind of felt like oh this is set up for more gags you know like right. i kind of just want to cut to the chase and get on to the next thing but there kind of isn't a, a, a real next thing beyond you know being told that that's his grandfather but but there was a part of me during that scene where he was telling him this story where where he, the story being that he's not his grandfather but he's he uh shared a jail cell with his grandfather yeah, and so he knows all about him. And his grandfather's dying wish was that this kid would get a good educa- uh, good education. So that's why he's here. A philosophy degree. Yeah, and get a philosophy degree. And the whole time he's t- saying this, a part of me was kind of hoping maybe that is true because when she first sees him, she's not even sure if that's really her dad. Yeah, and in fact, she. I mean, I think they play that beat again a little bit later, where she says like, "He's my father." Or not my father. And, yeah. and she doesn't quite know, or she says that at least to, to Matthew Broderick, I think, or maybe even Donald Sutherland. Yeah. And I like that too. I did like that thinking that, oh, now wait a second. Yeah. And I think that's part of the point with that, with the Robards character is, okay, which lie are you supposed to believe exactly? Yes. But I, I'm sort of like you. There's not a real payoff to that because it does end being very clearly painting the picture that, yeah, that guy is, is her father, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. There was never a moment where I'm like, oh, man, I feel like this guy really is going to die any moment now. And I really, you know, hope he finds some closure. <laughs> like, that was yeah. not. And it de- definitely does not end with you wanting to take that away, I think. You know, you know you're supposed to be kind of like happy that he's getting away with it kind of thing. You know, right. We're not supposed to be thinking about the fact that, oh, yeah, he's going to die in like three months. 
Yeah, and I, and, I, and I was surprised it didn't come out that he wasn't going to die. Right. Because I, I just assumed that was another lie. I guess my thing is, if he wasn't going to die, why would he leave later? Right. And then, and then the other part of it is, if he's going to do so much lying, maybe he doesn't lie ever lie to his daughter, and maybe that's one thing. Like Maybe that's one principle for him. But he lies to his grandson, so I don't understand <laughs> what the principle would be. But I, I guess my thing is, if you're going to lie that much anyway then why don't you just come in with a briefcase full of money and a different story in the first place? Right. Make the whole thing completely palatable. Just say, uh, this is money from a real estate deal I got, and, you know, I just, I want you guys to have it, you know? <laughs> just Yeah. You know, why even introduce the idea that, that it's bad money? Unless you're being honest for some reason, and, and I don't know if that was super clear. There's just a weird relationship that definitely Marsha has to his sort of buying their love, you know, and affection. Right. You get all the conversations that you can't do this, this is wrong, I don't want your money because it's bad money, it's tainted money. More importantly, she shouldn't want his money because, you know, he was never there for her when she needed yeah. it the most. But then, yeah, she needs a car. So driving the Mercedes, not that bad, you know? Yeah. And they never send any of that stuff back, <laughs> you know. No. The homeboy's got, like, a large screen TV and, like, every stereo component and the video camera and all Lots that stuff. Lots of Atari games. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're, he even adds on to the house and buys him a dog. Again, <laughs> all of which only, like, attracts attention from, yeah, from yeah, an already and, no, and nosy have, neighbor, you know. Exactly. Yeah. You have the nosiest neighbor in, in cinema history, <laughs> and everyone knows that that neighbor's there and yet none of this stops ever. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, that thing in that Ebert, excuse me, review about, you know, him buying the stuff being a little off putting. I felt the same way a little bit because usually you get that hammered home, that thematic thing of like, this is wrong. You can't buy my happiness. Um, right. And at some point that comes to a head and it really never does here. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. And, and it's interesting that sort of the emotional climax there, right at the end, is based on the fact that Max Dugan bought something for the grandson. Mm -hmm. That he bought him these batting lessons from yep. uh, the Chicago White Sox coach, batting coach. And, you know, like, it wasn't even Max Dugan who taught him how to bat. Yeah. It was, he bought him something. I mean, they, they play it a bit as that. Like, he buys the home run ball off the two kids that found it. That's a token of how important his grandson is and, and that, that moment of shared joy. Exactly. Yeah, he, he's he's definitely a sentimental guy. But they never really have a sentimental moment together. Kind of. True. I mean, because he's like, you know, he's watching the game from across the field in a you know trench coat and fedora and sunglasses. It's not like he's there cheering on his grandson. Yeah. Speaking of being incredibly conspicuous. Right. On this sunny day in, in Los Angeles. Trench coat and yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you this. So I actually, like, I, I like Neil Simon. I like things that Neil Simon has written. I hate to see his name in front of something, though, because I can't stop thinking about it being a play. And there were a lot of times during this movie where I felt like, oh, I, yeah, I see how that would be done on the stage. And, you know, like, that feels like something that would be in a play. And I'm just wondering, does, does any of that ever jump out to you? Do you ever feel like, oh, yeah, I can see why that would be on a stage? Uh well, Craig, if I'm not wrong, this was not written as a play. Was it not written as a play, uh, really? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think this was an original screenplay, and he has a handful of those. Because, I, I you know, here's the thing. Like, it's so confined. I, I, half the way through this movie, I am just was thinking, oh, this poor director having to shoot all yeah. these scenes in this apartment, which they do a great job of. I mean, I'm assuming that was probably, some of that was soundstage. It had to be, yeah. Boy, it doesn't look like it. It really feels like you're in this tiny-ass apartment. But yeah, unless I'm really, really wrong, I'm, I'm pretty darn sure I read this was an original script. That said, I, I think, yeah, some of those sentences, specifically with dialogue, and some of those conversations feel like stage dialogue to me. Yeah. The stuff that's cinematic is that I'm thinking of is like the weird montage of them riding around on the motorcycle when Donald Sutherland is trying to teach her how to ride. It's like this goofy thing where she's blowing through stop signs and almost getting killed. Even the motorcycle bit. Like I, I just could see in my head how that was on stage. I oh, kept really? Thinking, 
Yeah, like, and, and it I, just and I seems like, right. a, like, that, like that's the most cinematic. But I just you know I kind of see them and their lights and there's a lot of sound effects. The backdrop is going by in the background. Of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Sutherland is waving his arms frantically. But like, but like when they're watching, like when they're watching the baseball game, I could feel. I just felt like, oh yeah, it'd be her and him on the bleachers, and there's no game that you can see. It's them yelling, right. and like when, when when they saw him driving off at the end, that would just be them saying, "Hey, what's that?" And you hear like a car driving. I don't know. There were so so many of these things, and maybe it is. Maybe it's just being Neil Simon and having having written so many things. You know, like it it just it feels like a play. Yeah, that's that's probably just because that's his DNA to yeah. a degree. But let's say, I mean, I feel like, you know, yeah, this is this is a flawed little little story here. But I, I will say there's something of the time period that was kind of refreshing to watch for me. Mm. I feel like if this had been on TV on like a Saturday afternoon in 1989, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm sitting down with some Mountain Dew and a peanut butter <laughs> and jelly sandwich. I'm watching this movie. Yeah. No problem. Uh, well, honestly, and this, as a nine-year-old child, if I had watched that movie, I probably would have felt like a grown-up a little bit. Because mm-hmm. like this had no magical creatures, and yet I enjoyed watching. And also, I think a lot of that is like the direction, like this guy, Herbert Ross. Like it just, you know, it doesn't draw attention to itself. Like it just lets the scenes play out, and so you get mm-hmm. these nice performances. There's a lot going on. Like I, that was one thing that I noticed that felt like a play to me a little bit. Like every time they're in that apartment, it seems like nobody's sitting down. They're always oh, yeah. like, you know, drying off a bowl or something. <laughs> the oh, yeah, dishes. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's a lot of just little busy work, which the fact that I noticed that, I don't know, maybe there's a bit of a flaw. But at the same time, it felt like they were living in that environment. When's the last time you watched Footloose? It's been a while. I saw it maybe less than a year ago. It was on TV and watched a good chunk of it. You know, so many people remember, I think, that, that I've got to dance, I'm so mad montage that Kevin Bacon does in the empty <laughs> warehouse. Oh, yeah. But man, do you remember there's actually a chicken fight in the movie on very slow moving tractors? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and that and, sequence. And it's, and it's played for like maximum intensity. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's like a total sports montage or just sports, like, you know, it's like a sequence from Rocky. Like yeah. you got to watch that again because that to me I was like no that should be the thing that's remembered from this movie because I mean he directed the <laughs> hell out of that sequence you know because yeah. I, I just can't imagine being handed this script it's like I had to film a chicken scene on tractors are you kidding me like how the <laughs> hell am I going to do that and make it interesting and he yeah. does and so I don't know I, I I was not familiar with this guy's name really at all as a director but no I definitely well, I, I feel like he's he's certainly proven himself yeah I really want to see some of his other stuff solid stuff yeah. Yeah, there's a movie that he did called T.R. Baskin that Peter Hyams wrote, which sounds kind of interesting, and has our girl from Soldier Blue, Candace Bergen, in it from 1971. Oh, wow. Peter Boyle, Peter Boyle, always enjoyable. That one looks kind of cool. And then uh, he directed Play It Again, Sam, Woody Allen movie. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm really kind of glad that I know that name now and have yeah. a slightly better appreciation of his uh, filmography. Interesting. One thing that, that stuck out to me in the opening, for sure, was the animated sequence, the title yes. sequence. And the one thing I thought of was kind of Schoolhouse Rock, like the font is a yeah. little reminiscent of that to me. But I was looking this up, and I found this kind of cool thing about it here that I'll read to you, which apparently this is a site that I didn't know about. It was called Watch the Titles, and it's just mm-hmm. like the whole little tagline is forget the film, watch the titles, right. <laughs> which I love. So I'm, I'm excited to, to dive into this, but they did a little, they have a little page for Max Dugan Returns, and... Uh, the animator was Bob Kurtz. I think this was his first actual credit. Listen to this here. It says, The character Max Dugan doesn't come into the film until about a half an hour. So we wanted to do a background story of who Max Dugan was. We did these surreal animated scenes and then made the transition to live footage. But then I got a call from Herbert Ross who said, There's too sad of an ending to this film because we know that Max Dugan is going to die. So we're actually going to cut out the animated credits. And this guy, Bob Kurtz, said, wait a minute, I have an idea for the ending. And so he said he met with uh, Herbert Ross the next day and described what I wanted to do. At the end of the film, the dying character leaves on an airplane. They loved it. Our titles were saved by adding an end title. And so that bit where the car kind of flies off at the end in animation Mm -hmm. apparently was this guy's idea. And that that kind of leveraged the tone of it to work with the beginning animation, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. And then this guy also completely forgot about the fact that City Slickers 
as an animated title sequence. He did that. He did the uh, Curly's Gold sequel. He did uh, Honey, yeah. Honey, I Blew Up the Kid. Uh, Four Rooms, which I haven't seen in forever. Oh, man, I don't remember that at all, yeah. Yeah, he did that. And then he did the, the Pink, pa- Pink Panther reboot in 2006. So some you know some pretty cool credits there for you know that's a dying art the animated title credit it is <laughs> unfortunately because I think I did enjoy that quite a bit I know there was so, and there was something very early eighties about the animation yeah uh, like you said it kind of took you back to Schoolhouse Rock yeah and, for uh, sure yeah there's something about that feeling of movies then also just the way it looks just the way it uh, I don't know there's a hazy graininess. Well, yep. and I don't know if you know this, Sean, but back then in 83 and I guess a few years before that, Wait on me. movies were generally shot on film. Hmm. Mm-mm. So it really did have a different look to it. Something to think about. Craig, one other little interesting thing I found today while Hit looking me. around for crap on this movie. Uh, there's a website called movielocationsandmore.blogspot.com, and it appears to actually still be a somewhat active blogspot site, which I think is rare nice. <laughs> in 2016. Um, but I think this is just uh, done by a guy who enjoys finding movie locations and taking pictures of them, what they look like today. And he's got a whole ton of stills on Max Dugan. Uh, a lot of stuff was shot in Venice. And uh, wow. a lot of stuff looks strikingly similar today, which is kind of interesting. And so, yeah, if, if you want to see more about this movie or if you have a fondness in your heart for it for whatever nostalgic reasons, maybe go look that up or we'll post a link. I certainly will. Uh, on Facebook. Yeah. I've actually been sort of uh, watching the, the Poltergeist house, uh-huh. hoping it will go back on the market. You're going to get it, aren't you? I'd love to. <laughs> like what would you, would you put like something weird in the window? Would yes. you let people come up and take photos, or would you just tell them to get off your lawn? I would put me in that house. <laughs> that's that's as weird as it's going to get. Okay. A lot of uh, floating skeletons in the pool. you got to have a TV Let's that's just happens. on a static channel all day long, right? Some white noise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder how annoying it is to live in the poltergeist house. It might not be. People might not even care anymore. People are, like, the people who love the movie are probably too old to, like, even care yeah. about it, except for me. They're just like, ah, oh, that one from 2015, that was terrible. Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> this like, doesn't look like anything that. like that house. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't um, see that one. I don't know if it's terrible. I'm just, that was no. just me being a character, right? So don't. That's true. Give me no griefs. It's like Andrew Dice Clay. Yeah. He's not a sexist <laughs> guy. He's just it's a character. It just blew my mind. I don't think you're sexist either, buddy. Thanks. We haven't done a pitch yeah. bitch in a while. Let's do it. Do you have one? Well, yeah. So, so watching the movie a, a couple of times, it made me uh, think of of other stories that could uh, branch off from there. Now, I don't have a. It's not going to be the best pitch in the world, but <laughs> you know, I, I want to make the movie that I kind of thought it was going to be. Okay. Um, and it's it's hard to sort of transpose. Uh, now, can I guess just based on your previous please. pitches? You want to age up the Max Dugan character to be like 104, right? <laughs> so it'll be like Max Dugan barely returns. Is that is, yeah? Is that is that the average of of my my pitches? In yeah, the past? I feel like the main oh, character. Several of them older. have involved just really old people. <laughs> You're probably right. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I I kind of I kind of want the basic the basic same setup, which I liked a lot. You know, you mm-hmm. have this this two person family who's kind of in dire straits except this is going to be played a little closer to the bone a little uh, a little more serious yeah and uh yeah and this and and this guy comes back to town and he doesn't have a briefcase full of money you know actually really the feeling i keep i keep feeling about it it's not the same story at all but the feeling would be like something wicked this way comes okay and so this guy comes back and it's it's her father it's this kid's grandfather who should be a warm and lovable guy, but there's something dark about him. He wants to spend time with his grandson. And in return for that, like he's he's able to grant them sort of these mysterious wishes, more or less. Ooh. 
but each one kind of comes at a cost. It's one of those kind of things. It's like a genie. Yeah. And then, you know, eventually his, his actual plan for the grandson is revealed, which is probably to replace him in whatever dark arts that he practices because he's going to die. I like that. And then it's a fight between the mom and that guy for the, you know, for the kid's soul. Something like that. And I like it's that. Max Dugan burns in hell. I don't know what, I don't know what it would be. Something like that. Well, I will say, I, I, at some point I was thinking we should have done the joke that, uh, oh, did you see the original Max Dugan? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, it, but I figured we should skip it, right? It's funny you say that because as a kid, I, I kept thinking about that. I, I think I'm sure I probably looked for the first one. Do you have Max Dugan? Yeah. What are you talking Cause, about? Because there's another movie like that, except it is a sequel to an actual first movie. And for some reason, the first movie was never on video. Huh. And I can't remember what it was now, but it was always something, something, part two. And I was like, where the hell's part one? Maybe it's not it like was, a uh, Trolls 2 situation where it has nothing to do has with nothing. the first. I, I don't know. You know, I, for some reason, I feel like it might have been The Hills Have Eyes. Oh, okay. And in the, well, the rental store, for whatever reason, it was Did only The Hills Have Eyes 2. And I could never get the original, which was the mm. only thing people in Fangoria ever talked about. Right. I was deprived. Oh, man. Well... I'll find you a VHS copy of it somewhere, buddy. Thanks, bud. My pitch, kind of, mm-hmm. is I was thinking because <laughs> I love young Matthew Broderick so much. So I was just wondering, well, what if we could go back in time and redo this movie and it's actually Matthew Broderick is Max Dugan? Oh. Because when you first look at this, it's like, that does sound like it would be a, it sounds like an 80s kid name, Max Dugan. Yeah, absolutely. You know? He's like a Nintendo playing Lego fiend, Max yeah. Dugan. So I just, when I was going down this line, I thought, oh, what if, it'd be kind of interesting. Yeah. If, what if you had a kid that ran away when he was eight and then came back at like 17 to his mom and his granddad? And he had seen some shit, you know? <laughs> he, yeah. had, he had some lies and a briefcase full of money. Like to me, that's, that's pretty interesting. And Broderick, I think, could, could pull it off uh, with, with charm and, yeah. uh, and grace at that age. Mm-hmm. Maybe still now, I don't know, but he it would be weird to see him now as as like a 16-year-old. It would. Yeah, even with CGI, I don't think I want to see that. So I don't know. I, I I'm thinking of who could do this now cast-wise. I don't I don't know where that goes, but I just thought, well, maybe that's that's an interesting story. The that the, is run, interesting. the the runaway that comes home. You know? Yeah. I don't the kids still run that's away. Weird. Does that happen? I guess it still happens. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it happens a lot. They just, but it's like to run away for ISIS or something. Oh, well, Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's throw ISIS in here, then we automatic green light for this. That's what I'm talking about, man. Rip, rip it from the headlines. Boom. Last thing on this movie that I think we should at least tip our hat to is um, Jason Robards. How much do you know about this guy going into this movie? He's been around. He's in a million things, but yeah. when do you remember when he first kind of came into your movie consciousness? Uh, Man, that's a good question. Because I I don't think I ever knew he was in this movie. I mean, I've known for a while now, but like when I was a kid, I had no clue about him. Man, I don't know. I feel like you're going to hit me with a title. Well, no, I mean, just no, mine is like kind of embarrassingly late. It was Magnolia, really. Um, Really? Yeah. And I'm like, I definitely had seen him in other things. But um, that was certainly the first one. And, you know, I mean, Once Upon a Time in the West and he's in everything. You know what? Oh my God, it was Something Wicked This Way Comes. <laughs> he plays the dad of the two kids. That's exactly what I was thinking there of. There you go. Wow. Oh, so, so yeah, so the first time I ever heard of him was in Something Wicked This Way Comes, which came out the exact same year as Max Dugan Returns. Wow. Oddly enough, maybe I have those two intertwined in my mind, and that's why I maybe. thought Max Dugan was. Maybe that's the movie I was went to see. I was going to say, poster. maybe that's where you saw the poster. My mind is blown. Well, I really need to do my due diligence, and at least I want to see Melvin and Howard because I know, you know, yeah. seeing Magnolia and then hearing Paul Thomas Anderson talk about casting him, yeah. uh, and that was a movie that he referenced a lot, the Jonathan Demme movie about Howard Hughes. Yeah, I've just never gotten around to seeing it, and really, really need to do so. But yeah, he, he's great. Like, um, just sure. such an interesting presence, you know. Yeah, and, and perfect for that role. I think there's Agreed. nothing wrong with him in that role. Well, Magnolia was his last movie. That's it, yep. I think he was maybe sick at the time that he made that. Man. And um, played a sick person very, very effectively. He did. He was really good at that. Yeah. 
All right, then. But uh, yeah, that's a cool movie. I watched it on Amazon. I can't remember if it's on Netflix or not, but it's definitely on Amazon Prime. And... Yeah, I don't think it is on Netflix. So yeah, if you're looking for Max Dugan Returns, and you should, mm-hmm. head on over to Amazon. Get yourself some Prime. Get primed. Hey, uh, Sean, let's talk about what we're going to do in the next episode. Let's do talk about that. And in the meantime, we're going to do a mini episode. So again, if you're just tuning in, we'll be back next week. Don't worry. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be short. All right, Craig, I got one for you. I'm ready to go. Have you ever heard of a movie, 2015, called White God? Have you? Have you? I think you have. I think you have. <clears throat> Sean, I have heard of White God. That's right, you have, because you asked me about it, and I said I, I had heard it. Last time. But you know what? That's right. I think it's time that we do a very special Heard of It episode of our podcast and watch something that we both really, really want to see, we haven't seen yet, that not everybody will have heard of this movie, I promise. Yeah. But it seems like one that maybe they should have. So I say we break the mold and watch White God, which is streaming on Netflix. What do you say? I think it's time. I think it's time to step off the path. Mm -hmm. Shake things up a bit. Shake it. I hope we don't lose a lot of listeners over this. They could. I mean, this is pretty radical. (laughs) Yes. But, But you know what? I don't think we should be beholden to them. Yeah. You can get your pitchforks out. Yeah. We're going to have a whole team of dogs yeah. oh, behind yeah. us after we watch this movie. So um, go look for this. It is a uh, Hungarian movie, but I'm telling you, if you watch that trailer, or even just yeah. look at the poster, it looks very, very striking. I'm excited to see it. I'm glad that you brought it up a couple weeks ago, even though <laughs> I put the kibosh on checking it out. Then we'll watch this. We'll talk about it in two weeks. And in the meantime, keep your suggestions coming. And keep your eyelids open. Oh, yeah. So that you can see things and not bump into stuff. Never close your eyes. (laughs) It's good advice. Okay, until then. Right on. Thank you, Sean. All right. Thank you, Craig. Bye, Bye, guys. (laughs) 